It's the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Oh, oh, yeah, it is. But it's not just any Ross Tucker Football Podcast. It is a teaching tutorial Thursday presented by DraftKings. Professor Greg Cosell from NFL Films University is in the house. And this is a show that people listen to or watch at youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL over and over and over again. It's Greg's breakdown of the top six quarterbacks in the 2022 NFL draft. That's the good news. The bad news is I am realizing right now that I forgot to pick winners. I forgot to pick a spread the word winner at Ross Tucker NFL at Ross Tucker pod. I forgot to grab a sponsor confirmation email winner who takes advantage of any of our sponsors over at Ross Tucker.com or a YouTube shout out winner, youtube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. So you have time today, tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday, I'll pick them on Monday. My bad. I am also getting used to the off season, out of season, whatever you want to call it schedule. It's Greg Cosell time. The Big Show. All right, Greg. I look forward to this <laughs> every year. We are already shifting from post-Super Bowl mode right into pre-draft mode. Of course, we always start with the quarterbacks. Check out Greg on social media at Greg Cosell so you always know what he's up to. First question is pretty simple, Greg. Is, is there a guy that – out of the top six that really stood out to you that you feel like we should talk about first? Well, there is. and But I'd start by saying that when you evaluate a quarterback, and I've learned this from people a lot smarter than I am, uh, Ross, is you have to decide what you're asking a quarterback to do at the NFL level. Uh, most of us who've done this can look at a quarterback and see certain particular athletic and physical traits. But then you have to decide – what a quarterback is asked to do in the NFL at a higher level. Uh, And because it's easy to say, wow, he's athletic. He can run around, you know, and and we've seen a focus on that more and more in the way people look at quarterbacks, whether that's true of coaches is a different question when you talk to coaches. So ultimately when you evaluate a quarterback and you project and transition a quarterback, you have to decide what will he be asked to do at the NFL level? I'll just give you very one very quick example. If, if a quarterback plays almost exclusively in college in an RPO game, which many do, and, and he's very efficient in it, do you say to yourself, well, wow, that's great. He's going to be a really good pro. Because you and I both know you can't live in the NFL off an RPO game. So you have to ultimately decide what you're going to ask quarterbacks to do and what do they have to do to be successful at a higher level in the NFL. Because if you draft one in the first round or even in the top 40 or 50, that's what you're ultimately expecting. Well said. I agree. Who's the guy that stood out to you? I would say Kenny Pickett is the one who stood out to me the most. Um Don't forget, he played for Mark Whipple, who was the offensive coordinator at the University of Pittsburgh. And Mark Whipple, as you know, played, uh, coached in the NFL. Um, So Pickett was efficient from the pocket with a profile that I think is demanded at the NFL level. He played with vision, progression reading. There were full field reading concepts within the Pittsburgh passing game. He had a sense of timing. He had a sense of anticipation. For the most part, he had precise ball placement. He was athletic, and he had mobility to be a secondary action playmaker. Uh, He can be very effective as an executor and ball distributor, and that's where his game starts. And you saw multiple NFL route concepts, which demanded progression reading and did not present the simple scheme throws that define most college passing games. And you could see that Pickett was clearly comfortable with the process of being able to do that. Greg, you think there's any chance, whether it's you or the scouts or even coaches, that you almost get skewed Because you're seeing a guy execute pro concepts, whereas the other guys, you aren't. And it's almost like it's not their fault that their coaches aren't asking to do pro concepts. Correct. And 
you know, we don't know what Pickett would look like if he was just doing RPOs all the time. I, I look, I, I'll I'll just give an example. I know watching, having talking to college coaches while they watch high school video, it's a lot easier for them to evaluate and envision high school kids that are doing this, running the same kind of stuff than it is like my high school that runs the wing T sure. and the offensive lineman never pass block. You know, it, it, it's just harder for the coaches to make an evaluation. There's a little bit more risk they feel like they're taking. No question. I mean, it's funny you mentioned that about offensive linemen because I've had this conversation with Jeff Schwartz, who, who you know, Jeff, I'm sure, uh, played in the league for years, as you did. And he talks about a lot of offensive linemen when he watches them. And he says, God, I've never seen them in a, in a three-point stance. I never see them fire off the ball in the run game. So all that becomes a projection. The same is true of quarterbacks, you know, and which brings us to someone like Matt Corral, okay? Uh, Matt Corral played in, in Lane Kiffin's offense. It was a ton of RPOs, okay? It was a ton of shotgun play action. Everything was quick timing. You know, it was a highly schemed, tempo, high percentage, defined one-read pass game with a strong emphasis on quick rhythm throws off play action and RPOs. There was little straight drop back pass game until down or distance demanded it uh, or the or the game situation demanded it. Um, so you look at someone like Matt Corral and you say, wow, he's got a really tight snap delivery, throws the ball well. Um, he's a quick athlete. He was asked to run an awful lot by design at Ole Miss. That will not happen in the NFL because Matt Corral will likely be six feet, 200 pounds. So all this design run game that he did in the in college, and you love his high competitiveness and his outstanding playing personality, he's mentally and physically tough, you've got to remove that from the equation because that's not going to happen in the NFL. So you look at Matt Corral, who obviously throws the ball well, and you say, okay, now in the NFL he's going to be asked to do other things that you don't see on tape, and that's where – the due diligence of teams, which I can't do the way they can. I'm not going to be sitting down with Matt Carell and putting him at the board and asking him to go through a lot of pro concept and working through reads, you know, and having him express it to me. But you have to find out what your feeling is about that because he's going to be asked to do that in the NFL because you can't live on RPOs. I asked you if there was a guy that stood out and you said Kenny Pickett. Um, now you mentioned Matt Corral second, but that might have just been because of well, that was just uh, as the flow of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is was there a second guy you really liked, Greg? The guy I'm I'm extremely intrigued by, uh, and and again, when I say intrigue, he's not a top twenty pick. You know, let's put aside where guys get drafted and 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 making lists because you know I'm not a big fan of that. I love to evaluate the players. The guy that intrigues me is Desmond Ritter, um, because Desmond Ritter to me has the physical and athletic traits to develop into a quality NFL starter down the road. I, I would not see him as a guy you draft expecting him to step in and start, but he's got some size. He'll probably put on some weight at the NFL level. He's 6'3". I believe he was 207 at the senior ball. My guess is you can get him to 215, 220. Um, he's got some arm talent. He doesn't have a gun, but he can muscle it up and throw with velocity when needed. He's got mobility. He's very poised. He's very composed. Um, he can make second reaction plays. Um, he didn't look to leave the pocket, however, Ross, until his throwing options were exhausted, and he rarely broke down in the pocket unnecessarily. He was comfortable playing within the confines of the pocket and the structured pass game. And I thought there were snaps in which he showed subtle and efficient pocket movement, which I believe is a very important trait. So I think Ritter, if he plays in an offense with a run game foundation where play action can be a factor, where there are some R RPO concepts, um, I think he can operate and execute the drop back pass game as well. You saw progression reading elements to his game. So he's someone who intrigues me. As I said, we're not talking about a top five pick, but I think that he's a very interesting prospect for, for you know two, three years down the road. You know, I don't study the coaching tape like you do, Greg, um, of these college kids. I would say on the TV copy, 
I was pretty disappointed in Ritter against Alabama. Uh, you know, and obviously Alabama has better players overall than Cincinnati, but I came away from that game thinking for Cincinnati to have any chance to win this game, Ritter had to play a lot better than this. And Ritter I don't think had to play that, better I don't than he think did. he's that guy. I think he's I think in some ways he's a complement in an offense that has multi-dimensional elements to it. He's not the so-called lead dog. That's why I said I'm, I'm not talking about where a guy gets drafted. He's not going to be that guy. Um, uh, but the thing that that the only, one of the things that's concerning about Ritter is his ball placement can tend to be erratic. He drops his arm angle at times. These are things that theoretically can be cleaned up. Whether they will be, that remains to be seen. His delivery can be a little elongated. There's a lot of motion in his delivery, which can negatively impact both ball placement and velocity. And as I said, he will drop his arm angle and that caused the ball to sail at times. So there are things to be cleaned up. He's not a clean prospect. He's an intriguing prospect. Uh, you know, a couple guys, we were talking on the Fantasy Feast podcast yesterday with Wes Huber from Fantasy Points. And a lot of his evals are stat-based, right? Sure. It's, it's the numbers. So it's sort of the uh, coming at it from the opposite perspective. And remember... There's a slant with Wes towards the fantasy part of it, of uh, which is understandable. That's He works for fantasy points. I get it. Uh, the guy that he really liked, and I know a guy that a lot of scouts and teams liked coming into the year, was Sam Howell from UNC. They didn't have as good a year. And when you watched him, it felt like he ran the ball 20 times every game right. this year. Uh, really curious to hear your eval of him. And in particular, Greg, did you check him out this summer yes. based on his sophomore video and then his junior video? And was there a noticeable difference? Well, the traits don't change. I mean, you know, th that's the thing. I mean, he does possess NFL traits. There's no question about that. He's got a pretty strong arm. He can drive the ball at the intermediate and deeper levels. We know he gives you the running dimension, both by design and second reaction. Um, now, again, you look at their offense. He was almost exclusively a predetermined thrower in that pass game. And the issue with Howell is he's not really a comfortable pocket quarterback. He does not have a refined sense of timing and rhythm within the structure of a, of a detailed passing game. So the question becomes, can he be taught that in the NFL? I don't know the answer to that. If, if you believe he can be based on doing your due diligence, then you probably view him as a good prospect, someone who can be a quality starter down the road. Again, another guy who ran an awful lot. I don't believe he'll be able to do that to the degree he did at North Carolina. Um, the high percentage of Howell's timing and rhythm throws at North Carolina, Ross, came on RPO concepts and what we call bang play action, uh, which is basically one read. And you cannot build an NFL passing game solely on that. Now, I thought he showed enough flashes as a pocket passer to get people excited. Um, there's something to work with with Sam Howell, but there's there's also much to be refined and learned from a nuance and detail and discipline standpoint. And that's the question you have to answer when you evaluate him and if you draft him. Did he not play as well this year, Greg, or was it more a product of not having the stud receivers and the stud running backs around him? I think it's a combination of both. Um, clearly, the year before, there were cleaner throws and more defined throws with receivers like De'Ami Brown and Newsom, um, you know, two really good receivers at the college level, Brown being a, a pick of, the, of Washington. I forget who drafted Newsom, but he was a really good college slot. So there was some degree of that because the throws became more defined more quickly. Uh, and that always helps a quarterback. Um, but the traits don't change. Um, you know, and, and when I say they don't change, can guys get better at certain things? Yes. But guys don't necessarily change their overall traits. Let's get to Malik Willis. Uh, really, really interested to hear what you have to say about the kid from Liberty. Yeah. And, and he, he's a, tr he's a pure traits player. He's got a great arm and he's a great athlete in some ways he's built a little bit like Michael Vick you know with that solid body maybe even a little bigger than Michael Vick um 
again, what are you going to ask him to do in the NFL, particularly if you draft him early? See, as you know, Ross, if you draft a quarterback early, like let's say Denver drafts a quarterback at nine, they're going to expect that quarterback to come in and compete for a starting job and maybe even be the week one starter. So then you have to decide what can you ask him to do? How can he function in the NFL? Um, Willis has a relatively steep learning curve as far as NFL pass game concepts and the reading progressions that define the throws from those concepts and combinations. He was not asked to be a higher level progression reader or to have a detailed understanding of coverages or coverage rotation. So all that has to be learned. Um, the question is, how well will he see the field and make throws that are there? He left a lot of clean throws on the field. Now he has the run game dimension that always adds something early in a quarterback's career. And he's a phenomenal athlete. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, he had a tendency to move when he didn't have to, but he can make plays when he moves. He didn't have a feel for the pocket and the position. There's a lot of detail and nuance he has to be taught, but he's really, really gifted as far as his ability to throw a ball and his pure athletic traits. The last guy I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, is a guy that I, I called one of his games this yep. year, and that's Carson Strong from Nevada. He's another one. I think we might have talked about him a little bit during the season when I was about to call that game. You know, he had a really good tight end and a really good receiver too, I think, sure did. which which certainly helped him. Um, what do you see from Carson Strong? Because, by the way, when you were saying the guy you were extremely intrigued by – and you went with Ritter, I thought you were going to say Carson Strong. Yeah. That's and, what I thought you were going to say. And to be honest with you, I did not feel as good after I watched Strong this year with his 2021 tape as I did last summer uh, when we spoke about him for the first time before this NFL season. Um, he's kind of an old school pocket quarterback, Ross. His game's built on beating you from the pocket. He doesn't have any significant or game changing secondary action movement ability. Um, he must master the nuances, the subtleties, the disciplines of the position with a heavy, heavy emphasis on working out of muddied pockets and throwing with precise ball placement consistently. Now, he's an aggressive thrower. He's not really a check down guy. He's going to throw the football. Um, I think his lower body mechanics need work. Now, I know he's had a knee injury, so I don't know if that was a function of that. But even though I think he has a very good arm, he doesn't always throw with a very good arm. Uh, because of, of his lower body mechanics. There's not a lot, of, a lot of core talk and weight transfer to his throws. So his arm strength doesn't always show up. Um, he's going to need to learn to play under center. He's going to need to, to learn how to do the conventional play action pass game. And by that, I mean playing under center. Um, he doesn't really have movement traits. Uh, he certainly can make NFL throws. That's not a question. There were some throws that were special. Um but he has, the movement traits are really not there at all. So he must be protected well and consistently, and he must learn in the NFL to master the pre-snap phase of the position. And this takes time. You know, my issue with him is I have a tough time thinking of who the quarterbacks are that have come into the league recently. That are like that, him. That yeah. are like him. I agree. He, he reminds me more of, like a Drew Bledsoe, a Joe yep. Flacco, like that's the type of player. He's, he's tall, he's big, he's got a good arm, but yes, there aren't a lot of guys that are having a ton of success right now with his traits. You know, just Correct. being the tall. You know, twenty years ago, he would have been the first pick. You know, it's it's kind of changed a little bit. I feel like, and he's not like, for instance, you go twenty years ago, two thousand and three, I believe it was Carson Palmer was the first pick. Carson Strong's traits are not at the level of Carson Palmer's. And and you're right. Carson Strong is essentially that kind of old school quarterback. That's why I said that. He's an old school pocket quarterback. And those guys in today's NFL, unless they're truly, truly special. And again, you have to decide if you believe he could become truly, truly special. If you don't believe that, then that kind of quarterback does not really succeed at a high level in the NFL right now. His name is Greg Cosell. You guys already know that. You love him. I love him. At Greg Cosell on Twitter is how you get all of his content. Fantastic stuff, Greg. Case is going to be mad again. One, two, three, four, five social media clips. Ah. He's not going to be happy with you, Greg. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it. You know what else I appreciate? In addition to Greg Cosell, DraftKings, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Look, even if you're not into the NBA, this deal they got going right now, new customers can bet just $1 on any team and get $150 in free bets if they win. It's that simple. You're listening to a football podcast. Maybe you guys love football. Maybe you want to make NBA games a little more interesting for you. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code Ross. Bet just $1 on any NBA team and get $150 in free bets if they win. That's promo code Ross at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Tux Takes. Hey, Ross, good morning. Well, let's start in Green Bay, where general manager Brian Gutekun said that he has never told Aaron Rodgers that he will trade him. So this, this could be significant, Brian. Th- this could be a major issue. Because a year ago, Rodgers said, listen, we talked about it. And, you know, at the end of next year, if I want to leave, you know, they'll trade, they'll facilitate a trade to somewhere I want to go. You know, Rodgers said that publicly. And now Gutekunst is saying, yeah, I never told him I'd say that. So I'll be very curious to see how Aaron Rodgers responds to that. You know, it seemed like he was trending towards playing for the Packers. Seemed like everything was going in that direction. Does he look at this as Gutekunst calling him a liar? I'm not trying to start drama. I'm just saying this is Gutekunst publicly saying something that is the opposite of what Aaron Rodgers said publicly. So one way or the other, they gotta they gotta sort that out. Tux takes. Tom Brady's producing a movie called 80 for Brady, in which he's gonna play himself. So evidently, it's like Sally Field, and I can't remember who else is in it, but like I know the women that are in it. Evidently, it's based on a real movie, like. These Patriots fans from Boston wanted to get down to wherever that the game was against the Falcons, and they wanted to see Brady in the Super Bowl. I'll just, for our purposes, what matters is, doesn't sound like a guy getting ready to play football again. You know, starring in a movie is also producing in this offseason. It doesn't sound like a guy who's playing for the 49ers, because I've seen the rumors. Don't forget, though, a few years ago, he was in Ted 2. True. Tux takes. Uh, on the broadcasting front, Troy Aikman leaving Fox. He will join the ESPN Monday Night Football booth. Five years, seventeen and a half million per year. Wow. Well, a couple of things. First of all, good for Troy. That's amazing. Secondly, and these two go hand in hand. I don't think anyone tunes into a game. For the broadcaster. So I always think it's interesting what the compensation is. That said, I do think, and obviously I'm biased, I do think color commentary matters. I do think the broadcasters matter. I do think that they can make the broadcast better or worse. And if you're going to pay a lot of money for the rights of these games, it stands to reason that you want to get a guy that you think enhances the broadcast as opposed to making the broadcast worse. So it's interesting, the economics and how they've changed really with the Tony Romo deal. Tux takes. USFL has announced their first round picks. Any Anything noteworthy there? I think they actually announced maybe all of them now. I don't know. I don't know a lot about the USFL. I mean, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to, I'm looking forward to it. Um, it's going to be awesome, but I like football. I like that. These guys are getting another chance. I'm looking forward to it, but the guys that sat to me so far, Shea Patterson, the old uh, Michigan quarterback got drafted. I think by the Michigan Panthers, the Michigan team, Paxton Lynch had gotten his release from the CFL because he wants to play in the USFL. I'm just glad these guys are getting the opportunity. And mark my words, 
some of these guys are going to end up in NFL training camps and on NFL rosters. Happens every time there's one of these leagues. Tux takes. Buffalo Bills re-signed cornerback Saran Neal to a three-year deal that is worth uh, up to $10.9 million. So good for him because he's primarily a special teamer. He doesn't really even play that much on defense. So you can see how much the Bills value special teams and what Saran Neal brings to the table. Good for him, man. This is around when I signed my three-year contract extension with Buffalo. It was, you know, sometime mid-February like this going into my fourth year. Congrats. Tux takes. And we'll end it back with the Packers who restructured Kenny Clark's contract and it opens up almost $11 million in cap space. Well, they need it. Uh, They've got some serious cap issues. And so the question is, can they get a long-term deal done with Devontae Adams? I think Aaron Rodgers is trying to use his leverage to help Devontae Adams get the long-term deal that he wants because he knows Devontae Adams doesn't want to get tagged. So I think that's my guess that that's part of what's going on here. The other thing going on here is that you guys need to be aware of myfrontpagestory.com. I, I'm, it's almost to the point now where I'm getting almost an email a day from a listener saying they used it for Valentine's Day. They're using it for an upcoming birthday or anniversary. Of course, Mother's Day is uh, a couple months away. Pretty cool how many of you, like when I pick a sponsor confirmation email winner this week, it's likely going to be someone that went to myfrontpagestory.com because I'm getting a bunch of them, almost one a day, which is very cool. Let's do one email quick, Bri. Ever wanted to ask an NFL player a question? Well, here's here's your your chance. chance. It's time to ask Ross. Email address is ross at rosstucker.com. You can always get ask me any question you like. If you take advantage of a sponsor and then forward me the email confirmation you get from the sponsor with a question, I guarantee to read and respond to your question on the show. Today's question from Trevor. Hey, Ross, it's bizarre to me that it is 2022 and we still watch NFL from over the sideline. I feel like a camera behind the quarterback would be much better. What are your thoughts? Trevor Chow. Trevor, so as an offensive lineman, you typically like to watch it from behind because, you know, that's on the coaching tape. That's a better view of how the defense is lined up. However, you can't really tell yardage from behind Trevor, which is very tough for people. You can't tell if the guy gained two yards or eight yards sometimes when the camera's from behind. What I really think is the future is being able to choose, being able to have that option of I want to watch it from the end zone or I want to watch it from the sideline or whatever. I think that's sort of the next step. I also think shout-outs are in order for Pizza Boy Brewing, Sport of Culture, Vision Comics with an X, HumanHeadNYC.com, and SteakhouseSports.com. Check out the other shows. Fantasy Feast was awesome. Even Money, amazing. College Draft, of course, it's that time of year. I think we're done here. Thanks for listening to the Ross Tucker Football Podcast. Make sure to also subscribe to the Fantasy Feasts, Even Money, Business of Sports, and College Draft. All available at Apple Podcasts, RossTucker.com, or wherever podcasts can be found. A lot of times on the show, I mentioned DraftKings. Here's what you need to know. You got to be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. By the way, if what I was talking about included a deposit bonus, doesn't always, sometimes it does. Deposit bonus requires 25 times playthrough, and deposit bonuses are paid out in site credit.